The Age of Anxiety, 1914 to 1950. Mix. Key concept. World War I resulted in the end of the old order. This caused the collapse of several empires. We've discussed these before, but just to review, the Hohenzollerns in Germany, the Habsburgs of Austria, and the Romanovs of Russia, also the Ottoman Empire. Democracies in Europe remained intact or took root, however. Britain and France remained democratic. Germany became a democracy with the Weimar Republic. The new state of Czechoslovakia also was a democracy. In the 1920s, Communist totalitarianism took root in Russia, and fascism emerged in Italy. Fascism took power in Germany in the 1930s. These will be discussed in a le later lecture. Political crises in the 1920s were followed by the Great Depression. The New World in the aftermath of World War I created an age of anxiety. World War I was a staggering blow to Western civilization. Many people felt as if the world they knew had been turned upside down and they had little control to change things for the better. People saw themselves living in an age of continual crisis until at least the early 1950s. World War I Revolutions at the end of that war, political and financial crises in the 1920s, the Great Depression, World War II, and the onset of the Cold War. The 20th century was a very lethal century. Key concept. Modern philosophy reflects a lot of this age of anxiety. After the war, new and disturbing ideas began to spread throughout the population. Before 1914, most people still believed in the Enlightenment ideas of progress, reason, and the rights of the individual. The optimistic pre-World War I view was the result of significant progress in the past two centuries prior to the war. Critics of the pre-war war world anticipated many of the post-war ideas. They rejected the general faith in progress and the power of the rational human mind. We saw some of this in the realist movement with Realpolitik. Friedrich Nietzsche is probably one of the foremost philosophers of this age, showing the pessimism of this age. One of the most important critics of the rationalism of the Enlightenment. In Thus Spake Zarathustra, that he wrote between 1883 and 1885, he blasted religion and famously claimed God is dead. He claimed Christianity embodied a, quote, slave morality, which glorified weakness envy, and mediocrity. Individualism, he claimed, had been quashed by society. In his most famous book, Will to Power, published in 1888, he wrote that only the creativity of a few supermen, Ubernschmen, would successfully reorder the world. I may have pronounced that wrong. Though not widely read by his contemporaries, his writings seem relevant in the atmosphere of post-World War I pessimism, of which we spoke when we discussed the poetry that came out of World War I, the anti-war feelings, and the feelings of alienation. Fascist dictators, such as Hitler, were strongly influenced by the ideas of Nietzsche. Hitler saw himself as one of those supermen who would by his sheer will rise himself to a position of power.
Henri Bergson, 1859 and 1941, in the 1890s, he convinced many young people that immediate experience and intuition were as important as rational and scientific thinking for understanding reality. Georges Sorel was the one who came up with the idea of syndicalism. This was a manifestation of anarchism that we saw taking place in France. He believed socialism would come to power through a great violent strike of all working people. His ideas foreshadowed the Bolshevik Revolution that happened in Russia and the idea of control by an elite few. Not really what Marx had originally said would happen with a true communist revolution, but more like what Lenin had done in Russia. Key concepts. Now we've talked about Sigmund Freud before, so this is just a recap because his ideas start a little before World War I during that realist period, but then bleed over into the aftermath of World War I as well. Traditional psychology had assumed a single unified conscious mind preceded and, and believe that it preceded sensory experiences in a rational and logical way. Freudian psychology seemed to reflect the spirit of the early 20th century, with its emphasis on humans as greedy, irrational creatures. Freudian thought became an international movement by 1910 and received popular attention after 1918 when the war was over, especially in Protestant countries of Northern Europe and in the United States. Freud asserted that because the human unconscious, remember that was the id, because the id is driven by sexual, aggressive, and pleasure-seeking desires, humans are therefore not rational creatures. The id battles the ego and the superego. The ego, if you recall, is the rationalizing conscious that mediates what a person can do. It is one's reason. The superego is where our ingrained moral values are located and they specify what a person should do. Freud shattered the enlightenment view of rationality and progress. Freud agreed with Nietzsche that rationalism and traditional moral values can be too strong in the human psyche. They can repress sexual desires too effectively, crippling people with guilt and neurotic fears. Opponents and some enthusiasts interpreted Freud as saying that the first requirement for mental health is an uninhibited sex life which will get people into all kinds of trouble, you can imagine. After World War I, the popular interpretation of Freud reflected and encouraged growing sexual experimentation, particularly among middle-class women. This will also cause some issues later on. Key concepts. Post-war philosophers and authors expanded on the earlier pessimism from the realism period. Paul Valéry was a poet who spoke of the cruelly injured mind, besieged by doubts and suffering from anxieties due to economic, political, and social disruptions that took place in the 1920s as a byproduct of the World War I. A quote from his poetry, the storm has died away, and still we are restless, uneasy, as if the storm were about to break. Almost all the affairs of men remain in a terrible uncertainty. We think of what has disappeared, and we are almost destroyed by what has been destroyed. We do not know what will be born, and we fear the future. Doubt and disorder are in us and with us. There is no thinking man. 
however shrewd or learned he may be? Who can hope to dominate this anxiety to escape from this impression of darkness? Logical empiricism, also known as logical positivism, took root in English-speaking universities after the war as well. It was developed by Ludwig Wittgenstein, who was part of the Vienna Circle in the 1920s and 1930s. He said that philosophy is merely the logical clarification of one's thoughts. Abstract concepts regarding God, freedom, morality, etc., he argued, are senseless since they can neither be tested by science nor demonstrated by the logic of mathematics. Only experience is worth analyzing, he argued. Key concept. Anti-utopian authors reflected the pessimistic, uncertain future in this era as well. Oswald Spengler wrote Decline of the West between 1918 and 1922 as part of the aftermath of World War I. In it, he argued, every culture experiences a life cycle of growth and decline. Western civilization, he argued, was in its old age and death was approaching in the form of conquest by the Asians. T.S. Eliot wrote The Wasteland in 1922. In this, he depicted a world of growing desolation. Some consider it the greatest long poem of the 20th century. Franz Kafka portrayed helpless individuals destroyed by an inexplicably hostile and surreal, surreal forces. The Metamorphosis from 1915 and the Trial from 1925 and the Castle from 1926 all show this. Eric Maria Remark wrote All Quiet on the Western Front, and it was published in 1929. We've talked about this book before. It was a powerful novel detailing the horrors of trench warfare during World War I. He experienced the war firsthand, being a German soldier on the Western front lines. Stream of Consciousness became a new narrative style that sought to capture a character's entire thought process, usually in the form of an interior monologue with himself. Probably the most famous to you stream of consciousness was James Joyce in his book, Ulysses, published in 1922. A female author of note that used stream of consciousness was Virginia Woolf in her Mrs. Dalloway, published in 1925. Existentialism is a philosophical movement that took root in continental countries after World War II, but we see the roots of it in this time period after World War I. In the wake of the horrors of World War II and the advent of the atomic age, pessimism and hopelessness were expressed by these existentialists. These existentialists will build on the foundations founded by these earlier authors from the age of anxiety. Existentialists saw life as absurd with no inherent meaning at all. They viewed a world where the individual had to find his or her own meaning. Most existentialists were atheists. Probably the most famous is Jean-Paul Sartre. He wrote that life had no meaning and that humans simply exist you can see that this was a byproduct of the age of world wars. Albert Camus is another existentialist. He believed that individuals had to find meaning to life by taking action against those things with which they disagree. One's actions, he argued, are derived from personal choices that are independent from religion or political ideology. Martin Heidegger and Karl Jaspers were also prominent existentialists. Christian existentialists shared the loneliness and despair of atheistic existentialists. 
Their ideas can be traced back to Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard from the period between 1815 and 1855. The Christian existentialists stressed human beings' sinful nature, the need for faith, and the mystery of God's forgiveness. The Christian existentialists, however, broke with Christian, quote, modernists of the late 19th century who reconciled the Bible and science. They believed Christian faith could anchor the individual caught in troubling modern times. T.S. Eliot created his work within a perceived traditional Christian framework. He advocated literary allegiance to tradition. George Orwell was, a, was famous for his dystopian novels, which is the opposite of utopia. Animal Farm, which I believe you all will read this year, is an allegorical novella about the Russian Revolution that we just covered. It depicts events leading up to the Stalin era in the Soviet Union, which we will cover more in a later lecture. A quote, all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. This allegory takes animals and puts them in the position of uh, key historical figures from the Russian Revolution and the Stalin era. 1984 is another book by Orwell where he discusses Big Brother, the dictator, and his totalitarian state use a new kind of language, sophisticated technology, and psychological terror to strip a weak individual of his last shred of human dignity. 1984 is a book that you will read in 11th grade with Miss Sylvia. Another author, Anne Rand. She wrote a book called We the Living in 1936 that focuses on the struggle between the individual and the state. This was largely in response to the rise of totalitarianism that was going on at that time. Again, we will be covering that shortly. Anthem from 1938 portrays a dystopian future run by a totalitarian government. And The Fountainhead from 1947 championed individualism perhaps her reaction to having lived in the Soviet Union's totalitarian society. William Golding wrote Lord of the Flies in 1954. The novel deals with the dark side of humanity and how cruelty and murder result among a group of marooned youths. Some see the novel as an allegory regarding totalitarianism. The Theater of the Absurd also reflected the pessimism after World War II. Samuel Beckett was an Irish playwright who wrote Waiting for Godot in 1952. Throughout the play, two characters wait for Godot, perhaps God, but he never comes. The dialogue is just disjointed and convoluted and makes people wonder what is going on. Key concept, philosophy. Science. By the late 19th century, science was a major pillar supporting Western society's optimistic and rationalistic view of the war world, positivism. We discussed that before. The new physics, much popularized after World War I, challenged long-held ideas and led to uncertainty. We've talked about some of the new physics in an earlier lecture dealing with realism. Max Planck was one we discussed before, developed the basis for quantum physics in 1900. He postulated that matter and energy might be different forms of the same thing. This shook the foundations of 19th century physics that had viewed atoms as the stable, basic building blocks of nature with a different kind of unbreakable atom for each element. Albert Einstein, that we discussed before, is another 
In 1905, his theory of relativity of time and space challenged traditional ideas of Newtonian physics. E equals mc squared. This united apparently infinite in the infinite universe with incredibly small, fast-moving subatomic world. Matter and energy are interchangeable, and even a particle of matter contains enormous levels of potential energy, which we discussed before will cause a big ruckus with the advent of the atomic age. Ernst Rutherford is another scientist. In 1919, he demonstrated that atom could be split. Werner Heisenberg introduced the principle of uncertainty, sometimes also called the uncertainty principle, in 1927. As it is impossible to know the position and speed of an individual electron, it is therefore impossible to predict its behavior. Heisenberg's principle ultimately means the dynamics of an experiment alters the state of the subject. Niels Bohr developed a model for understanding the atomic structure and made contributions to quantum theory as well. Erwin Schrodinger, his work in quantum theory formulated the basis of wave mechanics. If any of you are familiar with the Big Bang Theory television show, Schrodinger's cat is a scenario that comes up now and again in discussions between Sheldon and Leonard and Penny. Enrico Fermi developed the world's first nuclear reactor. His work later led to the development of the atomic bomb. The impact of new physics on the common mind. The new universe seems strange and troubling, almost unknown. The universe was now relative and dependent on the observer's frame of reference. The universe was uncertain and undetermined without any kind of stable building blocks that were always the same. Physics no longer provided easy, optimistic answers or any answers at all, for that matter. This is a far cry from the scientific revolution with the advent of Newtonian physics. This will set all of that on its head. Key concept. Eugenics in the early 20th century. Eugenics sought to improve the quality of the human race through higher rates of reproduction among what they referred to as superior human societies and lower rates of reproduction through sterilization practices among inferior societies. The Nazis were big fans of eugenics, trying to promote the Aryan race. The philosophy actually began in Britain and quickly spread to other Western European countries, even in parts of the U.S. The policy eventually became associated, however, with Nazi Germany, as I stated, with its mass sterilization and murder of physically and mentally handicapped people, and later the Holocaust, the attempt to, at mass extermination of undesirable peoples. Key concept, art and entertainment. Functionalism in architecture was a big part of this new modern movement. Late 19th century US, we have Louis Sullivan pioneering skyscrapers and where he argued that form should follow function. In 1905, architectural leadership shifted to German speaking countries until Hitler in the 1930s. The Bauhaus movement is part of this. Walter Gropius broke sharply with the past in his design of the Fagus shoe factory at Alfeld, Germany in 1911. He focused on clean, light, elegant buildings of glass and iron. In 
This represented a jump into the middle of the 20th century. Later, the movement was subdued by the Nazis as modernism came to be viewed as, quote, degenerate. This is the Fagus Shoe Factory in Elfeld, Germany. It looks like something that was built in the 1950s, but it was built much earlier than that. Bauhaus will be very popular after World War II. The Bauhaus building, 1925 to 26, in Dessau, Germany, stands as the icon of the movement. Modern art. Pablo Picasso, whom we've talked about before, is perhaps the most important artist of the 20th century. He developed Cubism along with Georges Braque. He often tried to portray all perspectives simultaneously in a painting. Guernica is considered his masterpiece. It's a huge mural portraying the bombing of a Spanish city by the German Luftwaffe during the Spanish Civil War in 1936, which we will cover shortly. One of the quintessential artworks of the Age of Anxiety for its portrayal of suffering and death. Dadaism is another movement. Dada is a nonsensical word that really means hobby horse that mirrored a post-World War I world that no longer made sense. It attacked all accepted standards of art and behavior, delighting in outrageous conduct. Marcel Duchamp was the leader of the movement. His fountain of 1917, Duchamp took a public bathroom urinal, urinal and named it the fountain as a way of mocking traditional artistic standards. We'll see pictures of these works at the end of this lecture. L-H-O-O-Q in 1919 is where Duchamp took a print of Da Vinci's Mona Lisa and painted a mustache and goatee on the subject. Here is Marcel Duchamp's Fountain from 1917. And here is L-H-O-O-Q from 1919. Futurism developed in Italy. It was an artistic movement in the early 20th century that emphasized speed, technology, like cars and airplanes, the industrial city, youth, and violence. Its founder was Filippo Tommaso Marionetti with his Futurist Manifesto of 1909. The movement repudiated the past while glorifying violence and war. Futurism influenced Dadaism, Art Deco, and Surrealism. The movement influenced the development of fascism in Italy in the years following World War I. Surrealism developed out of the Dada movement during World War I. Salvador Dali is the most important artist of this movement. He was very much influenced by Freud's emphasis on dreams, as you can tell in his paintings. This one below is one of his most famous, The Persistence of Memory, painted in 1931. After 1924, Dali started painting a fantastic world of wild dreams and complex symbols, where watches melted and giant metronomes beat time in impossible alien landscapes. <coughs> Alberto Giacometti with his man pointing, illustrated the anguish of human existence in a world seemingly without meaning. Music. Igor Stravinsky, probably the most important composer of the 20th century. His most famous work is The Rite of Spring 
that came out in 1913, just prior to World War I. In Rite of Spring, he experimented with new tonalities, many of them dissonant and aggressive primitive rhythms. Arnold Schoenberg pioneered atonality, including the 12-tone technique. I will attach um, examples of both of these so you can click on them and listen. This style of music was somewhat akin to Wallace Kandinsky's non-figural painting in his extreme abstract expressionist style. Key concept. Movies. Moving pictures were first known as a popular novelty in naughty peep shows and penny arcades in the 1890s, especially in Paris. Charlie Chaplin, an Englishman, became the king of the silver screen in Hollywood during the 1920s with his movies, his silent movies. German studios excelled in expressionist dramas like The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari in 1919. The advent of talkies, films with sound, in 1927 resulted in a revival of national film industries in the 1930s, especially France. Motion pictures became the main entertainment of the masses until after World War II. Motion pictures, like radio, became powerful tools of indoctrination, especially in countries with dictatorial regimes. Lenin encouraged development of Soviet film making leading uh, Soviet filmmaking leading to epic films in the mid 1920s. The most famous films were directed by Sergei Einstein, Eisenstein, who dramatized the communist view of Russian history. In Germany, Leni Riefenstahl directed a masterpiece of documentary propaganda for the Nazis called The Triumph of the Will based on the Nazi Party rally at Nuremberg in 1934. Radio. Gu Gu Marconi developed transatlantic wireless communication in 1901. Radio was used for military purposes during World War I during trench warfare. Not until 1920 were the first major public broadcasts of special events made in Great Britain and the U.S., however. Most countries established direct control of radio by the government. Only in the U.S. was there private ownership. British Broadcasting Corporation, the BBC. Radio became used effectively for political propaganda. Hitler and Mussolini used radio very effectively.